Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so let's start. Um, I feel myself half a cyborg with all this equipment, but still. Uh, so we are going to deliver the fifth lecture of the course, and the topic is experiment in classical science uh, of modern age. So uh, here we have some principal questions concerning uh, these four aspects of the very beginning and uh, the development of modern age and modern age philosophy and the science of modern age. So first of all, we are going to uh, coin in the principal uh, theoretical propositions, let me say, uh, concerning two mainstreams that uh, were delivering during the 17th century. Uh, and the main persons here are, of course, uh, Francis Bacon and René Descartes. So the second aspect will, uh, that we are going to study today is the term of experiment as a kind of criterion of certainty or we could say accuracy because you have already mentioned I hope that there was no such a term, there was no such a concept of, uh, as experiment uh, before. So the science of ancient time or pre-science as we call it uh, during the second lecture as well as the Renaissance uh, science and so forth, they did not focus upon the very principle of demonstration. So this is a, a crucial uh, discovery, let me say, uh, which actually appeared at the very beginning of the 17th century uh, with uh, so, such powerful people as Galileo and Sir Isaac Newton. So the, second, uh, the third aspect of uh, our lecture is going to be dedicated to great classification systems and we will try to revise the m probably most outstanding and illustrious phenomenon of this period of time, so, uh, the great encyclopedia uh, that was published by the French Enlightenment um, with the chef editor of Denis Diderot. And finally we are going to talk a little bit about Immanuel Kant's philosophy of freedom. So we will try to explain what do we mean by philosophy of freedom, and this will be probably the very first break, uh, the very first break in a great wall of contemporary, not even modern science. So contemporary in these terms, I'm, uh, by contemporary in these terms, I mean uh, a bit of narrower uh, aspect of our modernity. So we will try to develop the, uh, th this notion further. So first of all, we have to say that there are two great traditions in history of modern philosophy. And the first is empiricism, while um, with uh, such the followers as, so, so the founder we, uh, of which is Sir Francis Bacon. And here you can see the followers, uh, such as Thomas Hobbes and John Locke and David Hume and so forth. So the second is rationalism, or as Hegel says, uh, idealism. Meanwhile, empiricism in his terms could be called uh, realism as well. So here we can see two principal mainstreams of philosophy and actually scientific approaches. Uh, well, the approaches of the main thinkers of modern age. And we, can, uh, we also have to take into strong consideration the very ideas of this movement. So uh, when we speak about empiricism, the, the idea is that any knowledge is based on empirical data or, and deduced from them. So when we speak about rationalism or idealism, uh, again in terms of Hegel, we mean that any knowledge is based on reason and deduced from it. So uh, the first movement uh, had an emphasis on the experiment and the research in uh, the research of nature as such because Francis Bacon really thought that there is no other opportunity of understanding and realizing the truth uh, except studying nature itself. So Rene Descartes actually had another purpose and had, uh, well, he had the same purpose but had another approach to it. So he thought that uh, the main instrument and probably the main um, possibility of studying truth is uh, realizing how do we think, how do the human beings understand these or that phenomena 
And that is, one, uh, that is why one of the crucial terms of the, ration, uh, of the rationalism is uh, the uh, reduction to our uh, own reason. Meanwhile, in empiricism, we can see the reduction to uh, the empirical data and investigation into science as such. So, uh, we can also remember a famous um, phrase of uh, Georg Hegel, who says in his History of Philosophy that when the age of modernity came, uh, we, so people understood that they're at home. So, when we started this period of time, which started from we don't mean the Renaissance here, but uh, it starts from the uh, 16th, 17th century. So here we may say we are at home. And like the marina, uh, ha after a long voyage in a tempestuous sea, we may now hail the sight of land. So here we can find the recall, uh, the recall of a famous phrase uh, that we find in Anabasis by Xenophon, as you remember, uh, their uh, people see the sea, right? See, uh, and sea in uh, Greek means talata. So they understand that they are going to go home. So they will know, uh, they are no more in Persia and they say talata, talata. So see, see, the, they hail the sea, uh, the sight of land, right? So uh, in these terms, we understand that the very beginning, the very break of modern age, is this, kind, this period of time where we uh, understand the terms correctly. We mean something and we understand it accurately. So I hope you remember that uh, Giambattista Vico's idea was that philosophy and philology must work together and one must contribute into another because uh, unless we know the term, unless we know the word or the concept, we cannot say, we cannot realize what really people meant in this or that period of time. That is why philology uh, represents uh, the exact or the accurate knowledge. So here, uh, in the very beginning of the 17th century, we start uh, the period of time where we understand everything or we think that we understand everything because we use uh, conventional terms, let me say. So now we are going to say some words about each of the founders of these two mainstreams. And the first is Sir Francis Bacon. So he is reg widely regarded as the founder of the empirical movement. You know that he was an English, an English lawyer, a statesman and philosopher. And some people say that he could even be considered uh, one of the authors or one of the creators of Shakespeare. So you know that Shakespeare is a uh, great doubt uh, in history of literature and history of uh, so-called Elizabethan era or Elizabethan age. And uh, nobody really knows if he has existed or not. But those who do not think that, that there was really such a person as Shakespeare, William Shakespeare himself, uh, they think that, well, one of the most probable figure here could be Sir Francis Bacon. Uh, but I have to say that I had the conversations to the scholars of Francis Bacon and they said that uh, there is uh, not a single hint on that uh, in his writings and probably this is just a, a kind of um, very artificial mystery, let me say. So his main idea concerning philosophy and uh, the philosophical approach in studying nature was uh, the great project of instauration of sciences. So his main treatise um, is called The Great Instauration of Sciences and probably the most famous writing of his is called The New Organon. Uh, so the title is taken from Aristotle's treatise which called Organon as such and Organon uh, in Greek that meant just instrument. So the idea of Aristotle was to give a, such an instrument to, uh, as an opportunity to struggle against the sophists who really thought that there is not a single opportunity to understand the nature of things as such. And the sophists, as you remember, even claimed that there are no gods and we cannot study the nature of gods. Uh, we can, uh, no, we can understand the nature of human beings. 
And that is why it, uh, for Francis Bacon, and you can see the quotation in your synopsis, so for, so for Francis Bacon, it was very important to uh, design such uh, a discipline, um, such an instrument uh, that could give an opportunity to realize how nature goes and what really is, uh, the, what are the mechanisms, what are the engines of the universe as such. Um, the main principle and probably the motto of Sir Francis Bacon's uh, approach is his famous phrase, scientia potentia es, or knowledge is uh, power. So the idea is that we possess the right method, so or we at least we are capable of possessing the right method of research of nature, and via this we can get correct data, so therefore the exact knowledge. So what does it mean that we get the correct data? That first of all means that we, uh, we are able to arrange the whole system of things, and when we have this system, and Bacon said that the best system for that, the best uh, the best approach to, the best method to arrange this kind of system is to create a table. So uh, when we have this, we understand that in certain uh, circumstances, in certain um, conditions, uh, or under certain conditions, this or that matter behaves in this or that way. So I can just give one example. Uh, according to the ancient Greeks, uh, we may say that there are uh, so, that when we study, for example, ice, right, we cannot say that ice, water, and steam are the same matter. It is impossible, because in terms of the ancient Greeks, they take different places in the world. You remember that uh, to, uh, so, so concerning the uh, scientific approach of the Greeks, uh, each substance, each essence takes its own part or takes its own niche in the world, in nature, and we cannot say that there is a kind of uh, mixture, we cannot say that there is a kind of confusion between different elements or different uh, essences, right, different substances. But we know nowadays that if we have, for example, water, and we will heat it uh, up to 100 degrees Celsius, we will see steam. And if we decrease uh, temperature, uh, under zero degrees Celsius, we'll see that water becomes ice, right? So we see that there are different substances, uh, it's not uh, different substances, but different circumstances make uh, this very matter behave in different ways. So this is the idea of Francis Bacon. We have to study nature under different circumstances and under uh, different conditions. And if we see that there is uh, a certain definition of this or that matter, under this or that condition, we have to put it in a certain part of a table, and this is a project of actually a great table. That is why the great classifications take, part, uh, take their place uh, in the development or during the development of the modern era. So, um, to describe this method of Francis Bacon, we could say that the, uh, it could be reduced to induction. So, what does it mean, the induction? It means that we have to study this or that substance one by one, right? And uh, we see the differences, uh, or we see a certain trend, a certain tendency, uh, after, meanwhile, studying. So uh, when we understand that there is a certain um, correlation between different substances and different objects, we also realize that there must be some reason for that. That is why it is very important to study the, uh, nature carefully. And actually, this is the idea of right question. So we ask nature correctly and accurately, and we, give the, uh, and we get the exact and accurate answer. It's interesting uh, that Sir Francis Bacon also coined this famous phrase. So truth is time's daughter, not authorities. Of course, you remember that Aristotle reigned for, or had been reigning for uh, quite a long time in history of science and history of philosophy and if we have uh, just a glance at the medieval philosophy or history of medieval science and thought we could see that Aristotle was the greatest authority ever so even Thomas Aquinas was under great Aristotle's influence and his system of world 
was really elaborated um, with great... Uh, um, so many aspects of his um, system of the world were really influenced by Aristotle. So Bacon was probably the first, uh, one of the first people who uh, started the struggle against authorities and uh, his, um, with his idea to create the whole system of things. Of course, we can remember Pietro Pompenazzi, a famous Italian philosopher, neo-Aristotelist, but um, he was just uh, the person who started this struggle. Uh, so Francis Bacon is also regarded as the first philosopher who started writing, uh, who started to write, sorry, uh, in his native language. So uh, most of his treatises um, we may read in English. And this is also very interesting because from this period of time, from the very beginning of modern time, we see the tendency of expressing the scientific ideas in, uh, the, in natural languages, in, not the Latin language as such. However, of course, there were many people who continued this tradition of Latin as a uh, language of science. Um, well, among them we could name uh, the famous philosopher Leibniz, about whom we will speak a, bit, uh, a little bit further. So the next person we have to um, study here is Rene Descartes as the founder of rationalism or idealism, I have already, as I have already mentioned. Sorry for misspelling, but still. Um, and, well, Rene Descartes is famous for his mathematical uh, project as well as uh, philosophical project. So he was very well uh, educated and he was brought up at the Jesuit College uh, at La Fleche, so that was in France. Uh, he, was, um, a very he was very enthusiastic about contemporary science and contemporary philosopher, uh, philosophy. We cannot say that he was very well uh, learned in history of philosophy, but he was very well learned in scholasticism and uh, poetics and rhetorics as such and languages and the whole line of his life uh, was the line of a traveler. However, he was uh, very careful with all that and he always uh, was looking for a quiet place to think. So there is an anecdote from his life when he uh, was a soldier uh, in the German army and he uh, came to Bohemia in Western Czech, well nowadays it's uh, the Czech Republic. So uh, he found an um, oven in which uh, he get in just to find the possibility to think for a while as a, in a quiet place. And he, the, he had an insight of his philosophical system. So after that he resigned from the army and went to Amsterdam when he lived the most part of his life and wrote his principal treatises in philosophy. And probably one of the most important treatises is Meditation on First Philosophy. So uh, on the first philosophy he uh, uh, understood metaphysics and this is the uh, conventional term for metaphysics or philosophy as such uh, since Aristotle. So in 1641 uh, he published this book and uh, in this book he introduced the principles of true knowledge. Uh, we will face with many people who thought that uh, their writings uh, rep uh, represent the true knowledge as such. So they are very enthusiastic of this truth actually. So uh, to, uh, to tell that mm, uh, basically uh, Descartes' idea was to demonstrate that God really exists uh, and this uh, so one part of the investigators and the scholars think that this is just uh, at the possibility uh, to avoid any um, difficulties from uh, the part of uh, the Catholic Church uh, on his status so other scholars think that he was really a great uh, a great believer and uh, this purpose was really his, but uh, the idea of that, as Descartes put in the very beginning of his treatise, is that God is actually the simplest and the most obvious thing, as well as our soul. So Descartes' idea was that we can understand and study the simplest and the most obvious things 
So what does it mean, the simplest? That means that they don't have parts. Of course, if God is perfect, and uh, it is omni uh, so he is omnipotent and omniscient and so forth, and he knows everything, and uh, well, he is responsible for everything that goes uh, under the sun, of course, he must be understood as probably the simplest thing, because if he has parts, or for example, our soul has parts, it's not perfect. So, in these terms, he thought that to, uh, to understand the complex things uh, or difficult problems, uh, we have to divide them into different parts. For example, we don't know how to solve the theorem. So we have to divide our uh, theorem into different parts and to solve them one by one. This is actually a great uh, mathematical approach to such instances as uh, studying of nature or investigation into society and after uh, when the 19th century uh, will, will begins, we will see something the same uh, in Auguste Comte's approach. But still, he says that our soul and God could be realized much simpler than the nature of things. Be and this is actually the method. So, uh, the method could be called the, ra uh, the radical doubt uh, procedure. Cogito ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am, uh, this is the main principle of Descartes' philosophy. So uh, he said that to uh, understand that something is or something isn't is very difficult because uh, nobody knows that the things that surround me, uh, that the outer world really exists. So maybe there is so-called Deus Malus or an evil god that um, tricks me. And that is why I have to be sure that the things around me, the real objects, exist. So how can I be sure? I must doubt in everything, says Descartes. And uh, this is the radical doubt. So I doubt that even me myself exists. So uh, after uh, I understand this doubt, I see that I can uh, follow this doubt unless I understand that there is nothing doubtless except my doubt itself. That is why I see that my realization, the very reason of mine, or my meditation is doubtless. So I cannot doubt in the very procedure of doubt. And that is why I cannot doubt in my thinking, in my uh, cognition, let me say, right, in my mind. So cogito ergo sum is one of the most influential uh, methods and approaches in the history of modern philosophy. And you can see that uh, the very first place in this approach takes the human reason. So, um, in Hegel's system, we will see that this place of uh, reason is crucial, and um, the absolute mind, as he says, or to be more accurate with this term, the absolute spirit, as he says, uh, Geist in German, uh, plays the most important part because this is. Uh, the very uh, actual realization of everything, right? Uh, it's also very illustrious uh, that Descartes said that it is impossible to reach any knowledge lest via the intuition of the reason and deduction. So we uh, have already seen that Francis Bacon uh, supported induction as the approach to realize and study the truth of nature. Descartes' idea was quite opposite. He saw that deduction is the best way to do it. What does it mean? So when we say that each person, so all people are mortal, and we know that this or that person is mortal as well, for example, John is mortal, we can see, oh, sorry, that John is human being, right? We understand that John is mortal as such. So this is a uh, probably the simplest example of this kind of deduction, and we can uh, call it after Aristotle, uh, the syllogism, or the way of uh, deduction things, right? So um, we realize that everything true that we can understand as true comes not from really the experiment on the empirical data, but our own realization, uh, the work of our own mind, and because we realize that only our mind is doubtless, according to Descartes' idea. So this is the very fundament of the idealistic movement, 
and actually the very uh, basis of rationalism as such. So after we have mentioned and started these two principal movements in history of modern thought and modern uh, approach to studying of nature, we have to say about experiment as a criterion of certainty. Uh, so, uh, of course, we understand that uh, modern science and contemporary science uh, as such cannot avoid experiment, and now we have to observe the, the very fundament of this experimental movement and this experimental tendency. So, the person who laid this fundament, that laid this basis, was Galileo Galilei, uh, who elaborated the principles of mathematical approach to uh, the study of nature. So, he was probably the first man who said that we have to demonstrate uh, our achievements in studying nature. And unless this uh, demonstration is presented, we cannot say that we really know anything or not. So, among his achievements, we can mention uh, that he, first, he was first who used telescope to observe celestial objects and phenomena, and that happened in 1709. So in 1732, he published his dialogue concerning the two chief world systems, and you understand that these two chief world systems are the one of Ptolemy and the one of Copernicus. So Galileo was an ardent uh, proponent of uh, Copernicus system. So in this treatise, in this writing, he uh, ex tried, to expound, uh, tried to expound his observations and uh, he was the first person who really got the sketches of what he saw uh, through the telescope. So this is an interesting principle. I see, therefore I know. Unless I don't see, I cannot say that I am sure in my uh, conclusions in the very nature of my understanding of things, in the very nature of my science. So I need to have a very accurate instruments that uh, really give me the, an opportunity to uh, explain my uh, observations correctly and exactly. And if it is possible, I have to publish my uh, achievements and it is uh, it, 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 it principally must be uh, the thing that I have to share with all people, right? So Galilee, in these terms, Galileo is also widely regarded, uh, is widely regarded as uh, the founder of uh, modern Italian language, modern classical it, uh, uh, Italian literature, because he also started to write in his uh, native language as Francis Bacon. He also invented pendulum and studied inertia in the f uh, and the free fall of bodies. He also elaborated the principles of classical mechanics and his phrase uh, that, he, uh, that made him uh, really influential in terms of history of science is that there is a book of nature, of course it is created by God and there is no doubt in that, but still the book of nature is written in the language of mathema mathematics. If it is written in mathematical language, that means that there is an opportunity for human beings to read it. So if uh, somebody knows this language, there is no problem to read this, right? The letters of this alphabet, as Galileo says, are triangles, circles, and other geometrical shapes. So if we know this language, if we know the alphabet, of course, after certain practice we will uh, see that uh, there are no principal mysteries uh, in, in how uh, the whole universe or uh, nature as such exists. So in Francis Bacon's writing, we may uh, meet such an interesting metaphor uh, as uh, the, clock watch, uh, the clock watch. So, the clock work, sorry. Uh, the person has created the work, uh, the clock, right? And uh, if we don't know how it works, we can only understand that, uh, so what time is it, right? We can just uh, watch the clock and see that this is uh, half to seven, for example. But if we know how it works, 
we can uh, intervene in the mechanism and we can uh, just improve it or we can see that uh, something goes wrong or something goes right. So mechanic or the person who knows how something works is a crucial metaphor for the whole age of classical rationality. And uh, this is very important because uh, unless we don't know how it works, we uh, cannot understand the nature of this or that phenomenon. So the observation is actually the principal thing that we can start our, uh, uh, from which we can start our uh, study of nature. And if you remember, uh, in the second le lecture we said about Hippocrat uh, Hippocrates, uh, whose principle was observation, and whose principle was no linocere, so uh, do, not, uh, do not make uh, harm, right? So uh, for, uh, it's interesting to make this correlation, to notice this correlation, uh, as when a Yeher, in his um, great book of Paideia, says that probably ancient medicine, ancient Greek medicine, is the very threshold of modern science. Not ancient physics, not ancient mathematics, not ancient philosophy, but ancient medicine. Because the main uh, demand of ancient medicine was observation and uh, realization of how this or that process, uh, of this or that process goes, right? So uh, the interesting quotation from famous German poet uh, John Goethe is that Galileo died in the year when Isaac Newton was born. So this is the celebration of Christmas of our modernity. It's quite interesting, really, that uh, Sir Isaac Newton was really born in the, end, uh, in the year when Galileo died. And as Galileo was the founder of classical mechanics, Isaac Newton was a great follower of his and uh, the, the, the person who developed uh, the very idea of modern physics. So he is the founder of the whole field of physics as such. So what is he always fa uh, also famous for? Sir Isaac Newton, and here you can see him uh, depicted by uh, famous British author and uh, painter as, uh, as well, uh, Mr. William Blake. So this is Newton uh, depicted as the great architect. You remember probably the uh, uh, famous Masonic metaphor that there is no certain God, for example, as Allah or uh, Jesus Christ or Jehovah, but there is the great impersonal architect who creates the whole system of the world. So here's Sir Isaac Newton as the great architect of the whole world. And uh, it's interesting also that in, uh, on, his, on the basement of his um, monument in Cambridge, it's written that uh, Sir Isaac Newton really understood uh, the whole nature of things and uh, he, great, he made a great um, privilege for the whole uh, world with his existence, right? So uh, Sir Isaac Newton started at Cambridge and then he taught there. He also was the president of the Royal Society, which uh, we discussed in the last lecture. So, uh, and he took this position in 1703 until his very death. He uh, was also the person who uh, watched the uh, right procedure of how to make the, uh, the coins and how to make money uh, under the King of England. And uh, he really was very influential with his uh, physical treatises, but we have to mention that he himself understood his uh, activity as natural philosophy. So uh, many people in, on the very threshold of modern age really thought that they are philosophers, not physicists, uh, in our terms. Galileo himself thought that he is philosopher. Sir Isaac Newton is also famous not for his uh, uh, physical treatises, but also uh, his theological treatises. And uh, in terms of uh, the number of pages, we can say that uh, the volumes of his theological works um, are much, uh, is much bigger than his physical writings. So uh, Isaac Newton really brought the basis to physics as a systematic study of natural phenomena. Uh, and his greatest book, his most important treatise uh, that everybody studies uh, in terms of history of science is uh, the philosophic princi uh, uh, the natural principles, of, uh, sorry, the principles of philosophy of nature, right, in mathematical terms. So 
uh, in this book, uh, we can find his famous laws, or, uh, which is called after him, so Newton's laws of motion, and the very theory of universal gravitation. And uh, we have to say that uh, certainly Newton understood that he stands on the shoulders of, his, of the giants that were his predecessors. So Johann Kepler uh, is famous for discovery of three laws of motion of planets, right? Isaac Newton is famous for his universal uh, gravitation theory, uh, theory of universal gravitation, sorry. And uh, unless Kepler's achievements, he couldn't formulate this universal term, this universal, the universal concept, as well as unless uh, Galileo, he was not able to represent it in terms of mathematical signification. So he, uh, now we know the formula of this uh, law. And if you write this formula, or formula everybody will understand um, what we are talking about, right? So probably Galileo and Newton laid also the basis of how to represent their achievements and how to represent their ideas uh, in the language of mathematics. And it is very, it is very important in terms of uh, the tradition of signification, of mathematical signification of modern uh, science. The second important treatise that uh, was written by Sir Isaac Newton is his optics, and this is an interesting spelling. So uh, he uh, published it in 1709, and uh, in, in this book he described his experiments uh, with light. Uh, so he took prism and he found that light uh, is not uh, unite, uh, well, it, it, it's not one, right, uh, as a spec so, but it has the specter in itself. So uh, when we see that light goes through prism, we can find seven, uh, or in terms of uh, the English language, six uh, colors. Uh, and that is why it is you know, very, so th th this experiment showed the very uh, importance of experiment as such, right? We cannot say that observation uh, without the instrument is, uh, without any instruments could be really useful. We have to have exact, in exact instruments, and that is why those who studied nature also gave us the first examples of improvement of uh, uh, the instruments as such. So uh, Newton is also famous for uh, his mm, experiments, not only uh, with lights, but uh, his theories. And uh, he is considered to be the follower of the corpuscular uh, theory of light. But here we can remember his famous phrase, uh, hypothesis non fingo. Uh, which we could translate as, I do not expound the hypothesis. So, uh, actually, uh, the scholars say that uh, Isaac Newton could be regarded anybody, and uh, it is not very important for himself as a figure, but not the person who really created the hypothesis. So, if this or that fact is not based upon observation and exact experiment, we cannot say a single word about Sir Isaac Newton's influence on that, right? So, on the one hand, we have a very in influential tradition of hypothetical uh, reasoning. So, we have to coin in hypothesis and then see how it could be uh, approved by a certain demonstration under these or that uh, conditions. On the other hand, we understand that uh, the very experiment uh, gives the basis of our uh, understanding of this or that fact and truth as such. So, um, after Isaac Newton, uh, and in, his, uh, t in, in the time of his life, uh, we will find different people who really um, develop this idea and try to join these two um, approaches to re uh, of realizing how nature goes. So, among those who followed Sir Isaac Newton, we have to remember a famous contemporary of his, uh, Mr. Robert Boyle who was an Irishman, and uh, uh, he was famous for experimental work on gas and there. So um, he concluded that air consists of tiny particles, so that is why it can be pressed. Of course, it is impossible to, uh, give the, uh, to propose such um, 
a theory or to propose such uh, um, an observation, uh, so, so uh, propose such uh, just a claim of nature uh, if we cannot demonstrate our idea, right? And uh, Robert Boyle was uh, one of those who started delivering his works with the whole laboratories as uh, we understand this term nowadays. So he had people who helped him and among the most famous people who uh, was his collaborators, we can remember Mr. Robert Hooke. So he wrote a famous book uh, which called in, uh, in Greek micrographia. micrographia. So uh, that means the description of very tiny things. And uh, he also is famous for improving the construction of microscope. We have to remember how actually microscope uh, appeared. So the Dutch merchants are famous, so are well, were very well known sellers of uh, fabric. And uh, here you can see the picture of flea. And uh, that was the very problem. So fabric, uh, usually people sell fabric full of fleas. And in order to, uh, to escape from this problem, to find the fleas as such, uh, they used uh, su such prisms as we could see the proto-microscopes or pre-microscopes. And uh, this was very imperfect. So they, just can, uh, they could see only um, just the hints, not the very fleas, right? And that is why uh, Robert Hooke, in, in terms of his uh, observation and experimental activity, had to improve the very construction of microscope uh, which gave him an opportunity to draw such tiny objects as fleas, for example. But uh, the golden era of, microscope, uh, of microscopes starts uh, not from Robert Hooke as such, but a very enthusiastic investigator of, ta uh, of uh, the small world, uh, Mr. Antony van Leeuwenhoek, who uh, was actually probably the first who used the improved microscope of Hooke and we, do, we have not to, uh, m m uh, to confuse these two figures uh, together. So uh, he started to use the improved version of microscope in his, in his investigation, and this is how it worked. So actually, here we have the construction of microscope as such. The person, saw, uh, 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 so the person observed in this uh, tiny hole, and we needed the flame as uh, the very um, source of light. So here is the needle upon which we put the very small, the very tiny object. And if it is flea, for example, it must be dead, of course, not to jump away and run away from that, right? And uh, after this observation, we can, so while this observation, and here are just tiny particles in, uh, in blood that uh, Leeuwenhoek saw. Uh, after this observation, we have to depict it in our notebooks and then publish. So it's very interesting what were the objects that Leeuwenhoek uh, started. First of all, they were uh, t such tiny objects as fleas uh, and lice, of course. Then uh, Leeuwenhoek started a human's uh, sperm and human's blood, so he was the first who depicted the very blood and uh, spermatozoids as such. And after this great uh, investigational work, after this observation, he published uh, his pictures and sent them to the Royal Society in London. After that, they had to examine his observation, but how was that possible? So uh, the, very f uh, the president and the fellows of the Royal Society ordered uh, the same microscope of the same construction from the same uh, person who created the one for Leeuwenhoek. And when they got uh, this object, each of them just came uh, to microscope and saw the same thing. After they saw the same thing and they compared the, uh, those with what Leeuwenhoek depicted in his notebooks, he signed that they are, no, uh, they are really sure uh, that the very um, picture and what they saw uh, are the one thing, right? So uh, they saw the same. 
So this is actually probably the first example of so-called peer, uh, peer reviewing as we have in uh, modern journals nowadays, right? And uh, it's also very important to notice that uh, those people who take part in this kind of examination were not on, only uh, scientists as such, but they were always donators. So those people who g uh, gave money to uh, support the Royal Society, because those who took part in Royal Society, even the president, had a very small pension from him himself. In Fran for uh, well, comparing, for example, to French uh, Academy of Science, the situation was completely different. So the next person whom we have to mention, who elaborated and well, who continued and developed this scientific approach, this approach of observation uh, of uh, chemistry in uh, the field of chemistry, was the priest uh, Joseph Priestley. So this is an interesting rhyme with his activity and his surname, uh, and he's famous for uh, discovery of oxygen. He didn't realize what really he discovered. And he was the proponent of a famous theory of um, phlogiston. Uh, so he called uh, the substance he discovered dephlogistoned air. He really thought that there is such an element that helps uh, the flame uh, to burn. You know that phlogiston was uh, the quintum, uh, quintum essence, let me say, right? The fifth essence that the, uh, the contemporary chemist thought uh, helps the, uh, support, uh, supports fire as such. And we uh, really, so uh, the person who disproved such a theory was Antoine Lavoisier, the French chemist and the founder of, contem of modern, fr uh, of modern uh, chemistry. So he demonstrated that Joseph Priestley uh, discovered the, uh, the new element, not uh, the variation of phlogiston or air or anything like that. So, according to a famous principle of uh, Occam's razor, we have, to say, uh, we have to say that Lavoisier tried not to multiplicate uh, the essences without necessity. So he showed that if we have oxygen uh, in a vessel in which, uh, for example, the candle burns, and we uh, remove all the oxygen from there, so we got the void, the vacuum as such, we could see that there will be no air, right? uh, sorry, no flame, right? That meant, actually, that no phlogiston exists, but the very element of oxygen. So Lavoisier actually gave oxygen its own name, and uh, we can say that uh, that was a great step uh, in uh, the further investigation of uh, chemistry as we have it nowadays. He had very unfortunate fame. As you know, uh, Lavoisier was a nobleman and he was guillotined uh, during the French Revolution in uh, 1794 uh, when, the so uh, when the Jacobins came to his, ca uh, to his study uh, and he said that he is uh, the member of uh, French uh, Academy of Science. They said that they need the citizens not the scientists, and uh, his head just fell down uh, from the guillotine. Uh, so the French uh, Academy was closed under ja uh, the Jacobins, and he was Napoleon the, Sen uh, the first who uh, reopened this academy, uh, which works until nowadays. So now we have to uh, observe some uh, examples of great classification projects and uh, probably the first great classification uh, that we can remember uh, during this modern age period is the one of Francis Bacon's, as he saw uh, the human knowledge as such. So uh, he thought, of course, this is just uh, a part of his great classification because it's really huge, it's gigantic, so it is not possible to study it very thoroughly uh, in terms of one lecture. So it is the whole system, and I can just uh, deliver one example from that, right? On the one piece. But I hope the principle will be clear. So uh, Francis Bacon thought that in, in, uh, if we speak about human knowledge, we can find three principal uh, parts uh, of uh, how can it act, 
right? So they are history, poetry, and rhythm. And here, uh, human knowledge is really the senior. Human knowledge is the ruler here. And that is why we have to give the divisions of the, uh, each of these uh, domains, each of these fields. In history, we can see three principal divisions, which are natural history, civil history, and the applications of history. For example, we speak about the geolog uh, genealogists. We speak about the kinship of different, uh, royal, uh, uh, of different royal families or different noble families. So we can say that they were the predecessors or ancestors. They were uh, different um, kinmen and so forth. So there are really many applications of history as such. Meanwhile, the natural history could be either epic and it concerns the events or inductive. So we study different phenomena one by one, right? The civil uh, history could be the church history or the ecclesiastic history. It could be scientific, so we uh, count uh, these or that discoveries or these or that developments of uh, human, re uh, human re realization of uh, science and nature as such. Or it could be civil, uh, mainly civil. So here we face uh, with... Um, the deeds of heroes, the deeds of uh, kings, the nobility, and those people who developed uh, the society, right? Among poetry, we have also three dimensions, which are epic poetry, dramatic poetry, and parabolic poetry. So what is parabolic poetry? This is the poetry of metaphors. When we try, uh, for example, in the myths, we try to give the comparisons. Uh, when we say uh, that, uh, I don't know, the dawn could be compared to Ares, and Eris we mean as a god of dawn and so forth, right? So this is a certain parabola or metaphor, we could say. And uh, it is quite influential because Sir Francis Bacon is also famous for his um, uh, book on, treat, uh, on wisdom of the ancients, uh, where he tried to explain the myths of ancient Greece uh, in terms of his inductive philosophy. When we speak about reason, we have to mention that there are two main movements here. The movement of theology and the movement of philosophy. So, among philosophy and theology we will not mention because, well, it's really complex and very obscure, so this is uh, not uh, our cup of tea, let us say. So, uh, concerning philosophy, it could be also twofold. The first is natural philosophy and first philosophy as such. And you remember uh, we had the same term in Descartes' treatise, so that meant metaphysics or philosophy as we understand it nowadays. So the study of the reasons, the study of the causes, right? So if we focus on natural philosophy and first philosophy, so we continue to um, get our focus na uh, narrower and narrower, so you see the logic, right? Uh, we can say that in, in natural philosophy, we can have three principal criteria. The first is mathematical, the second is theoretical, and the, thir uh, the third is practical. If we study the mathematical approach to nature philosophy, uh, for instance, uh, we can remember Galileo's attempts. Uh, we, can remember, we can mention the pure mathematical philosophy, uh, mathematical natural philosophy, and mixed. So pure is uh, the domain where we study the mathematics as such, and the mixed is when we try to apply the mathematical approaches to the understanding of empirical data. So we try to describe, for example, the um, miscellaneous empirical data uh, with formula in terms of mathematical uh, projects and so forth, right? Uh, when we speak about theoretical natural philosophy, we also can see two domains, uh, the one of which is physics and the second is metaphysics. So here he understands metaphysics very, uh, in a very narrow uh, sense, uh, in the sense of studying the reasons, um, the same as Aristotle understood that. And finally, when we speak about practical natural philosophy, we can say about mechanics and magic. So magic is uh, not like uh, Harry Potter's field. This is, something like, uh, this is something closer to our understanding of chemistry, right? 
And we, when we speak about the first philosophy domain, we, we can see two great development, uh, two great movements and two great fields, uh, to put it, the doctrine of man and axioms of sciences. So axioms of sciences, I hope this is very clear, so this is the fundament, the basis of sciences as such that could be developed only in terms of philosophy. Uh, you remember that not a single science represents its own foundations because it works with empirical data. But the doctrine of man could also be threefold, let me say. The civil science, or how we can arrange uh, life and society, and how can we understand the nature of the state as such, so-called the social philosophy or philosophy of history. Uh, then the second point is uh, the nature of man. So this is uh, how uh, man, uh, what is the origin of man, right? What is his difference from uh, all other rep uh, representatives of uh, the natural world, for example, birds uh, or animals or so forth, uh, and so forth. And finally, the philosophy of man. So concerning the philosophy of man, we can mention uh, the field of, uh, that focused on body and the philosophy of man, which is concentrated on, uh, which is focused, sorry, on soul. So how the body works and how the soul works. Probably you know that uh, one of the crucial uh, challenges of Descartes' system was uh, the uh, realization of how body and soul work together. So this is the uh, elaboration of so-called body, uh, mind-body problem. Uh, and uh, Francis Bacon really divided these two fields of investigation and said that body and soul are really two domains that, could, that must be studied differently. And, well, uh, here also in this domain of the doctrine of man and soul, uh, we can see uh, the domain that studies the types of soul and the capacities of soul, right? So what types of soul could be, for example, the natural soul or, I don't know, um, the, ma the masculine or feminine soul or something like that, right? So, um, with their characteristics and uh, their features. And finally, how the, wo uh, the soul works, how uh, they produce uh, what we uh, see as the action of a certain person. And well, finally, concerning these capacities, we can uh, say that there are two principal uh, fields of investigations that we uh, can arrange here, which, uh, so the one of which is ethics and the second is logic. So this division and this reduction could be continued, right? We can only try, uh, we, we only try to show the very principle of this division, right? So this is how Francis Bacon tried to classify and arrange the miscellaneous and very various uh, ob sciences uh, and achievements of different uh, studies, right? The second great classification, which can also be very lustrous in terms of uh, the, pro uh, the approach of modern age uh, representatives uh, uh, to the arrangement of the whole empirical data, is the one of Carlinius. Or, or Carlinius. So uh, he is famous for coining uh, the, the botanic taxonomy, and uh, here, here we can see the application of this taxo uh, taxonomic principle to the world of animals, right? So his taxonomy is based upon the criteria of genes, uh, genes and, species, uh, and species, right? So we have the domains which are more uh, complex and uh, wider than um, the step, the, the level of kingdom. So the kingdom is vaster than phylum. Uh, narrower than film is the class and then order so it's more specific as it's put here in the, uh, under the arrow so order is less specific than family family is less speci specific than genus and genus is less specific that, uh, than species in these terms we can say that, uh, that the human being the man gets the opportunity to classify any uh, object of human na of uh, nature um, concerning uh, the um, correlation to these or that features, right? So we can understand that 
for example, uh, I don't know, cats, right? Are not, uh, cats are not different from lions or tigers or pumas and so forth, but cats uh, are just uh, the cousins of lions, the cousins, right, uh, of pumas and so forth, of um, different uh, cat-like uh, things, cat-like animals. So in these terms, we are like the new Adams, let me say. So you remember that according to biblical myth, Adam was the one who gave names to uh, animals uh, and plants, right? Carl Linnaeus' nickname was uh, the Northern Adam because he gave this opportunity, he elaborated this classification of how we can name uh, these or that objects concerning a certain principle. So this is a twofold achievement. On the one hand, we as the scholars, we as the scientists, are able to give the names to any objects of, in the world. On the other hand, we are also the objects that are represented in the world, and we also could be classified in terms of this project. You know that uh, people, the human beings, are the cousins to apes, right? So we are the, the primates, as they say, and this is actually the name of Carl Linnaeus, uh, he meant that, uh, so, so he coined these terms uh, by the analogy. So we are the princes uh, of uh, the whole natural world, right? The next example of uh, such uh, a great classification is the doctrine of uh, Gottfried William Leibniz. He was a famous uh, mathematician and physicist he was also a very influential philosopher who really founded the philosophy of the academic style of philosophizing in the home German speaking uh, world. And uh, he, is famous, uh, he is well known for his monadology, uh, which is based upon the very principle of sufficient reason. So, uh, what does it mean? You remember that there are three principal laws in Aristotle's logic. So, uh, Leibniz elaborated the fourth principle and he said that we cannot say that something exists except we have the sufficient reason, reason for, this, for such an existence. So if there is no existence, uh, sorry, for, there is no reason uh, that the, something exists, we cannot find anything like that in nature and that is why we do not have to speak about the hypothetical existence of this or that thing. So we uh, must always mean that this or that object, this or that phenomenon in the whole world takes its own place and it is represented as a certain um, autonomous atom in comparison to uh, the physical uh, field. So this atom was called by Leibniz a monad and the very doctrine of monads, or monadology, as he, call, uh, he, uh, as he gave the title of uh, his main treatise, he understood that these particles are simple and indivisible uh, substances, the activity of which is in representation. So the one can only percept, uh, one can only feel that uh, these monads exist, but uh, nobody can understand that is ex they exist unless they are perceptible, right? So the whole mon, uh, the whole world, according to Leibniz, is a monad. Um, the, the human soul is a monad as well. So th these are the simplest things, and monads are autonomous. That means that they uh, do not need anything from the outer world to improve the existence, so they are perfect. God is monad as such. Uh, so monads, as Leibniz says, has n uh, have no doors or um, windows, but uh, there is the possibility for them to interact with each other uh, in terms of perception, so they are able to percept each other. Not all the monads, but some of them, which are higher. So the lower layer of monads do not percept anything, and we can find such kind of monads uh, in, for example, not natural, but physical world of stones, uh, of rain, right, of uh, different, climate, um, different climate phenomena and so forth. But, of course, people can understand each other, they can speak uh, the same language, they can um, 
learn something new, they can study nature, they can believe in God and so forth. That is why these kind of monads can percept each other, right? So they have this capacity and that means that uh, the very understanding of the world is pr principally is possible. As far as it uh, is based upon the principle of sufficient reason, we have, to, uh, we have uh, also, also to mention that according to Leibniz's doctrine, we live in the world of pre-established harmony, and this is his term. So he meant that there is a certain order in nature which uh, God himself elaborated, and we live probably in the best of all the possible worlds. Uh, this gave uh, Voltaire a possibility to mock uh, he, uh, Leibniz's doctrine uh, and he said uh, so the pessimists such as Arthur Schopenhauer uh, later said that we uh, on, on, on the contrary we, we live in the worst uh, world possible but still Leibniz really thought that if God creates the world uh, according to this principle of sufficient reason which is completely logical he cannot stop his creation until he gets the most uh, perfect world possible, right? Uh, and even if we have something evil here in the world, that means that this is really sufficient uh, that, uh, for something good to exist, right? This is how he really tried to uh, explain the existence of evil uh, in the world, and uh, he coined this term of theodicy, uh, which is actually the justification of God. Right? We could translate it as justification of God. Of course, uh, we know that God is responsible for uh, all the evil things that happen in the world, but Leibniz tried to justify the presence of evil, uh, and he, his approach is completely logical. Leibniz is also, uh, Leibniz is also regarded as uh, the predecessor of uh, so-called mathematical or math uh, well mathematical logics. But still, uh, his tri uh, many of his treatises were not published until his death, and that is why we can say that his influence was not only on the contemporary philosophy, but uh, the fallen philosophy as such, especially on uh, Lord Bertrand Russell, who started his activity in the very end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. The next example of great classification is Diderot and D'Alembert's uh, project of encyclopedia. So in 17, from 1751 up to 1766, they uh, were publishing the uh, 26 volumes of uh, encyclopedia or systematic dictionary of sciences, arts and crafts in the French language, uh, which really was arranged as uh, under, the certain print, uh, 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 under the certain principle of interrelation of knowledge. So what is encyclopedia as such? And what is the difference from dictionary, for example, or vocabulary, right? So in encyclopedia, we can... Uh, okay, let us just take uh, uh, Wikipedia as the example, right? So when we read Wikipedia, we know that uh, there are certain um, links that gives the opportunity to, co uh, to correlate, to connect uh, different articles, right? So if we click this link, we can get to another article, yeah? For example, we read about Denis Diderot, and then we see, okay, he was uh, the, one of his contributors was, uh, one of his contributors was uh, Jean Leron d'Alembert, so we don't know this man, we click on the name and we get to another article, right? So we do not need to get uh, out from this source. We can find all the information inside the source. That is why this is the encycl encyclopedia, or in terms, well, if we translate this Greek word exactly, we will see that this is uh, this circle uh, education, right? So education in circle way, in Kukla Paideia. So cuculus means circle and paideia means educational upbringing. So in these terms, Diderot and D'Alembert wanted to show, the main intention actually was to show that all the sciences and crafts and arts as well uh, are interrelated with one another. 
And if we have the achievements in sciences, we, have, we must have the achievements in crafts and arts. And this is a kind of novelty because uh, the previous attempts to give this kind of dictionary was just the descriptions. Uh, the descriptions. For example, we can recall, uh, we can recall a famous dictionary of Pierre Bale, uh, where he just gave the articles as the descriptions of the activity of this or that philosopher or this or that uh, school of philosophy. Uh, of course, that needed, uh, that demanded a great state, uh, a great staff, sorry, of contributors. And among them, we can remember the best representatives of the, the Age of Enlightenment, uh, among whom we can recall uh, Mr. Candillac and Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Helvetius uh, and de Montesquieu, Voltaire as uh, an uh, a very enthusiastic contributor, and of course a famous economist, Tugo, and many other people, right? So Dini Diderot actually was the editor-in-chief from the very first volume up to the very last volume, and he also ex uh, examined the maps and the diagrams and different schemes in the very last volumes because he wanted to give the best project possible uh, in terms of uh, this intention we have already described. So the idea of encyclopedia was rather influential and we can see that uh, many philosophers and uh, scientists of the modern era and postmodern era tried to elaborate such a system of knowledge uh, in terms of which every, every, each object uh, could be uh, related with another one, right? Uh, um, uh, concerning a certain principle of arrangement the very system. A good example of such an intention is Hegel's system of absolute idealism. We are not going to uh, study it very thoroughly, but uh, um, to continue just the uh, idea of encyclopedia, um, we have to recall his idea because he also uh, thought that he creates uh, a certain encyclopedia of uh, philosophical sciences. So principally his idea could be reduced to the following. So he thought that uh, it is thought or idea or spirit, or which is usually translated into English as mind, <clears throat> which develops not only in uh, our minds, not in our heads, but also in nature as such and in uh, the sciences as such, and the very crafts and philosophy and arts. So. He thought that we have to study the examination of the whole world from logics because the best explanation of the world could be only logical. That means we can express the world via and through our own um, speech. Our, um, so it could be only described uh, on a certain language, right? So to describe it in a certain language, we have to obtain a certain terms, the certain concepts that could be concrete, not abstract, but concrete. So Hegel thought that the most concrete discipline is philosophy because it works with the whole, with all the achievements of natural uh, and uh, philosophical sciences. So we start from idea, and this is uh, the very first step. It's God's will and thesis of the world, and through our thought we can get to logical system of the world that is elaborated by our reason, but at the same time, the whole idea, which could be understood as idea of God, so uh, it works as a certain spirit or mind which realizes the part of God in history and in nature as such. So nature is, the, is how the whole absolute spirit represents itself uh, in space. History is a higher level how the uh, absolute spirit, absolute mind, represents itself in time. So, uh, as far as we are higher, according to Hegel, in the great classifications of the modern era, as we are higher, com well, higher beings comparing to animals or stones or anything like that, of course, uh, history is a higher level than the level of empirical data. Right, the level of uh, geology, for example, of uh, physics and so forth. That is why after we understand how nature goes, and this is actually the second volume of his three volumes of Encyclopedia of Human, sorry, of Philosophical uh, Sciences, 
we have to get to the understand. Uh, so again, right? Uh, nature is how space works, right? This is the philosophy of space, we could say. Uh, then we have to go to observation and realization how our spirit works. So we have something in the nature, we observe it, and then we realize our observation. So this is a higher level of development, a higher level of um, investigation of nature as such. So you remember uh, the thesis of Descartes. We do not study the empirical data as such, but we study our perception of them and our realization of them, right? So we have to uh, develop our, um, we have to develop our mm, knowledge uh, and base it uh, on mm, logic, right? Not the uh, pure experiment. So we have to, not only to observe, but to think and interpret uh, the empirical data. So once again, Hegel really thought that philosophy is the most comprehensive field of um, studying uh, both nature and spirit, as, uh, and both uh, nature and spirit, and uh, this is the domain where uh, we can see the absolute truth. We can find absolute truth. So, absolute truth is actually how God or absolute mind um, represents itself, both in nature and uh, in reason, right? Both um, in the outer world and in the inner world. And finally, uh, here we can give the example of uh, the great chemical classification of the elements, uh, which was elaborated by our Russian scholar, or oh, sorry, scientist Dmitry Mendeleev. Uh, you remember that this uh, periodic uh, table of elements gave not only the opportunity to study the elements as such, but to predict the uh, um, elaborate, well, the pr predict the discovery of these or that elements, right? So, uh, when... I can't find silicium here, <laughs> sorry for that, but still, uh, silicon, right? Uh, but, okay, this is a famous um, story. Ah, this, that's it, right? So, this is silicon, right? Uh, so, when Mendeleev really uh, started uh, try to arrange his periodical system uh, in the second part of the 19th century, he said that there must be a certain element which he called eco-silicium, right, or uh, that could be compared to, with, um, in terms of its characteristics to uh, silicon. And uh, he, just, uh, uh, he just left a certain space in this field where uh, germanium is, right? And after this, so after he arranged this periodical system in this way, uh, it was really possible to discover the new element with the predicted characteristics, with the predicted features, right? Of course, uh, this table gives us a, an instance of how uh, scientists observe the very arrangement of nature. So everything in nature is interrelated and we can arrange everything according to our investigation, observation, and interpretation of empirical facts, right? That is why we say that classical science, and we're speaking about the uh, foundation and uh, development of classical science as such, so the classical science uh, really means that we have to interpret the empirical data and arrange it in a certain system you see that this certain system is actually faceless. I mean, we do not need any subject to say that this is objective, right? Uh, so subject doesn't take any important part in this kind of system. So we say that it is objective because we arrange and systematize many objects and many phenomena, but we as subject do not intervene uh, in the process. But when we will speak, uh, so when we speak about <coughs> post-classical, um, uh, science, we will see that uh, the very investigator, the scientist, or subject as such, plays a crucial part in the observation. So this is how these two big paradigms differ. And finally, we have to start at the last point of our agenda. This is Immanuel Kant philosophy, uh, which um, we have to. We can start from a famous motto of Immanuel Kant, "Sapere Aude," which we could translate into English as "Dare to Know," 
and uh, the whole body of his philosophy, according to himself, as he gives uh, this notion in his uh, lectures on logics, could be reduced to the uh, to four following questions. So, what can I know? What ought I to do? What may I hope? And finally, what is man? So, Kant said that uh, the first question is answered by metaphysics. So, what can I know? This is the fear of knowledge, and that is why it is answered by meta metaphysics. The second is answered by morals uh, or ethics, we could say. The third, by religion or theology, in terms of Kant, rational theology. And the fourth is answered by anthropology or the doctrine of uh, man, right? The field of studying of man. So in reality, has, says Kant, all this might be reckoned under anthropology, so the, uh, the field which studies man as such, since the first three questions refer to the last. And that's true. Really, only man can know something, only man can do something and can ask about the possibility uh, or the permission of this or that action. Only man can believe or only man can hope. And in these terms, anthropology, uh, in terms of pragmatism, as Kant says himself, uh, could be the most philosophical discipline. You remember that we said that the classical science, uh, well, the very modern era, goes under the sign of anthropocentrism. So Kant was, uh, could be called probably uh, the most influential anthrop uh, anthrop anthropocentricists uh, in terms of uh, modern philosophy and the very approach to philosophical investigation. So this is the last slide <laughs> we, uh, we have to study. So the principal positions of his transcendental, uh, transcendental or critical philosophy. Why is it transcendental? Because Kant meant that we have to study the a priori terms. So a priori means that uh, so those terms or those conditions that precede any um, or anticipate any experience as such. So without them, we cannot percept anything, we cannot realize anything, we cannot know or feel anything. So this is just a kind of the system of coordinates as uh, Descartes put it, right? Critical it is named because uh, Kant developed his system, his philosophical doctrine in the books, which was called the Critiques. He, he uh, wrote his famous, three famous critiques. The first of purism, the second, and this is the theory of knowledge. The second critique of pragmatic reason. Oh, sorry, practical reason, uh, beg your pardon. And so this is the ethical doctrine. And uh, the final critique of judgment, which is uh, the aesthetics, right? Uh, the doctrine of beauty and how we percept uh, art as such. How can we understand uh, beauty in art? So, as I have already said, we need to establish our knowledge. And Kant says that the very basis of any knowledge, <coughs> I beg your pardon, and uh, so the very basis, the fundament of any knowledge starts from experience and nothing else. So to establish it, uh, we have to give the pr or deliver uh, the, pr the, universal, the universal and essential principles. By deliver, I mean that we have to understand them. Of course, we cannot give them because we are, we, uh, everybody has, already, um, has already, already got it because we are all human beings and we are equal in these terms. So, Kant's philosophy of freedom must be understood in terms of principal equality of all people on earth. You know, for example, that, uh, for instance, famous philosopher of the uh, 17th century John Locke, uh, 17th and 18th century John Locke said that, uh, for example, foreigners, which he understood as uh, non-Europeans, all the non-Europeans, uh, women, children, the infants, madmen, and so forth, they are not equal to men, Europeans, adults, and so forth, right? Why? Because they cannot deliver the same statements, they cannot propose the same uh, ideas as the adults, uh, the Europeans have. This is the prejudice of, modern, of uh, modern era, of the first stages of modern era, which Kant's really disproved. And he says that as far as we all have the same system of mind, as far as we think in the same way, we all are equal. 
beside our uh, color of skin, beside our nationality, our race, in terms of Kant's um, science, besides of our sex, and so forth. So we all are rational, we all are reasonable, that is why we all are equal, right? So uh, Anna ha Hannah Arendt, a very influential thinker of the 20th century, tried to elaborate, I would say, tried to reconstruct the political, uh, political um, philosophy of Kant on this basis. And it's quite interesting how uh, she really tried to is, um, interpret uh, Kant's theoretical positions in terms of this intention. So, uh, here are some principal terms of Kant's philosophy. Transcendental versus empirical. So, transcendental means the conditions and circumstances under which we can feel something. Empirical are those uh, things that we can understand due to our a priori um, sensuality, right? A priori uh, forms of sensuality. So we all have two forms of sensual, a priori forms of sensuality, which are space and time. So uh, they are not objective; they are completely subjective. That means that we cannot find them anywhere in the world, in the outer world, but inside our own mind, inside our own heads, and. Due to them, we can see that all objects really uh, make influence on us, on our sensuality, on our feeling. That is why we work with uh, objective, uh, well, more the subjective, sorry, world than objective. So this is an interesting scheme. Let's have uh, a glance on that. So Kant's idea of perception in mind starts from a certain phenomenon. As I have already mentioned, each uh, part of our knowledge starts from experiment, the experience as such. So here we have, for example, a tree, which is object from the outer world, but still we have a uh, certain sensibility, the principal uh, arrangement of our body, for example, our sight, right, the possibility to hear anything, uh, the sense of taste, uh, of, we can touch something and feel it and so forth. So our sens uh, sensibility is uh, this instrument which percepts the object. For example, I can see the tree, right? That means that light goes in the way that tree reflects in my eyes and the very uh, reflection of that goes into my mind, into my brain. But unless my a priori uh, mm, types or, or a priori sorry, forms of sensibility, I cannot percept anything. So there must be something in my, um, in my mind as a certain computer, as a certain instrument, right, well, that I have from my very birth as a human being, that gives this sensibility an opportunity to become thought and to get into outer intuition, which of course then gets the form of thought. So I can see three. I understand that this is something uh, that I know or I see for the first time, it doesn't really matter, but it has certain form, it has certain color, shape, it moves or it doesn't, and so forth, and I can get the idea of what I see. So I can say, this is tree, right? Or this is man, this is woman, this is, I don't know, uh, this is camera, right? So anything. So according to this, we all understand uh, the world, not because we are um, passive, as Descartes said. So Descartes really, uh, the established, uh, he really established the idea of subject and object in our uh, exceptional world, he said that we, as far as we started the world as such, we are the active subjects. Kant said that everything is, com uh, everything is completely opposite. So the objects uh, influence our, or on our sensibility, and that is why we are actually passive. So this is called Copernicus uh, revolution, uh, uh, Copernican sorry, revolution that Kant uh, arranged in philosophy because he, uh, he showed that um, our th that subject uh, sorry uh, that everything we understand as the outer world is actually subjective because we understand everything in terms of our own subjective uh, perception right so thank you very much for that <laughs>